functions. Chapter three, linear functions. That's what our whole goal of this chapter is, lines. Now, you're saying right now in your head, Mr. Howe, I've seen lines before, I've worked with lines in middle school, I know what y equals mx plus b is, this is easy. And that's good that you have some background. And if you have no background, that's okay also. I'm gonna start from ground up, but I'm also gonna note, you're gonna also notice that we're gonna do a lot more advanced stuff than you've done in middle school. A lot more challenging word problems. Um, a lot more of an emphasis on functions and not just equations and the differences between those things, okay? So there will be a lot more to this chapter. If the first lesson is a bit of a review, that's okay. It's a nice, easy lesson for you then. Take advantage of it. When I was in college and I had a calc course, or like I started in Calculus 2 when I could have started in Calculus 3 because I placed out in high school, Calculus 2 was nice to start in actually because I had a lot of review in the beginning and it was an easy grade boost. So take advantage of this as a review to make sure that you get 100 on this quiz that's going to come from it and that you're doing the homework properly and that it's easy homework for you. If it's new, that's fine also. You're learning as we go along. So we're talking about what we call open sentences. Your book uses that phrase. An open sentence in two variables, it means equation. Open sentence and equation are, are, are synonymous. Okay, so equations with two variables. We have so far only looked at equations with one variable. With one variable. That's what this lesson is going to be about. So let's, let's begin and start. So an open sentence is something that has a solution that is a pair of numbers. A pair of numbers. And we usually call that pair x comma y. Right? x comma y. It's a coordinate that's a solution really. So it's not just x equals 5, but the answer now might be 5 comma 7. 4 comma 3. It's a pair of numbers that give us a solution. Now what's interesting to note is that open sentences or equations with two variables have infinite solutions every single time. Always have infinite solutions, always. Every point on a line is another solution. Let's write that down. Every point or every coordinate on a line, every point on a line, every coordinate on a line is a solution to that equation. Every point on the line or on a line is a solution to that equation. To that specific equation. Let's look at our first example here to see that. And again, there are infinitely many solutions because what is a line really? What is a line by definition? Uh, the rise of change y over change x. So it's What's a line? Something that goes on forever. Okay, more than that. Give me even the bare bones of the definition of a line. Oh, wait, my bad. Sorry, I would have line in my definition. Okay, that's all right. It's like a bunch of points. It's an infinite amount of points strung together. Hold on. An infinite amount of collinear points. Now, again, I know if you haven't taken geometry yet, but I'm going to drop some of those phrases, right? Collinear on the same line. Collinear on the same line. So we know that if I do this, take a look, and I connect all of these dots, that's what a line is. I'm trying to do it as best as possible. I know it's not perfect, right? But a line is infinitely many points stacked next to each other or on top of each other or rising with each other. Now, in this course, we're going to also learn about parabolas and cubic functions and rational functions and all these other weird functions that have curves to them. And a, a curve is also an infinite amount of line of points, but those points are not collinear. So this is an infinite amount of points that are collinear. Uh, is collinear a double L or single L? Collinear. One L? I don't know why I felt like it was like a double L. It just looks odd, that word. So that's what a line really is. And the difference between a line and a curve is simply that a curve, the points are not collinear. A curve is the same thing though, right? A parabola is an infinite amount of points in some shape or some, some curvature. So when I think of a curve like this, right, it's the exact same thing as this piece right here. It's the same thing. An infinite amount of points, sorry, but not that, it's over here. I have to word that. I have to word that there. Right, so it's literally this. This is the same definition for a curve. It's an infinite amount of points strung together. That's all it is. Now, we're going to learn in you know, pre-calculus and calculus that you might have endpoints and the curve might have gone forever. A line can be a segment and it stops at certain ends instead of being an actual line. A line can extend from one segment or one point infinitely outward, that's called a ray. 
So you'll see variations of these terms, but these are the general phrases, line and curve, line and curve. So let's look at this first example. Find five different solutions to the following open sentence, or the following equation. God oh, bless you, Jim. Find five different solutions. Now, if Bridget decides to choose certain values that Altea chooses different ones, it's fine. It doesn't matter. So it's up to you to decide at this point, because there are infinitely many solutions. John, give me a value between 1 and 10. 9. So let's make x equal to 9 for the first coordinate. If x is 9, we can find the corresponding y value. If x is 9, that means we have 36 plus 3y equals 24. Subtract the 36 over, that gives me negative 12. Negative 12, in, 3 into negative 12 gives me negative 4. So there's one of my solutions. So what I'm getting at is, based on what you choose as your independent variable, we'll go over that phrase in a little bit also a little bit later, independent x variable, whatever you choose for that, impacts your answer for y. And that's logic. Look at the equation. If I pick a different number for x, I'm going to get another number for y here. For problems, you might get the same value for y, where there's symmetry, right? You go 3 up 5, negative 3 up 5. That's possible for a problem. But for a line, assuming the line is not horizontal, assuming it's on a diagonal at some rate, these answers are always going to be unique from each other. Yeah, they're always going to be unique. Now, do I want to plug in x over and over and over and have to resolve six times? No. So what should I do? What should I do so that I don't have to solve for y five times? I don't want to plug in a number, solve for y. Plug in a number, solve for y five times. It's a waste of my time. Such a waste. So what do I do instead? Think back to what we did. Clark? Find the slope. The slope can help. And we'll get to slope where it helps. But more simple than finding the slope. Even simpler than that. Y by itself? Yeah. Isolate the variable y right now with the equation first. So let's go ahead and solve for y. So before you get the next four coordinates or solutions to this equation, solve, solve the equation for y. We should all be able to do this at this point because we did it in chapter one, where we solved for a variable in terms of other variables. I'm going to show the steps, even though I keep saying I'm not going to show steps anymore, just because I want you to see what's happening here for this part. Take a look and see if you got the same thing. Check your work. We're subtracting 4x, and then we're dividing by 3 to isolate the variable y. You can simplify this piece, but that's still going to be 4 thirds. Yep. Personally, I would leave it the way it is because it looks like a lot of our answers might be in terms of thirds. I don't have to deal with 8 and then subtracting 4 thirds times another number. Can we, can we see why I would do that? I'll tell you. You probably see it, but let's see if others. Take a look. I'll tell you ask the following. Why not just write it like this? But she's right. You can write it like this. Take a look. Right? This works. Does everybody see how this works? 3 into 24 is 8. 3 into 4 is just 4 thirds. But when I plug in for x now, this is messy. If I plug a 2 in here, I have to do 4 times 2 divided by 3, subtract that from 8, and then subtract the fraction, right? It's more work. So plug a 2 in here, look how easy it is. 16 over 3, you're done. And use that as an improper fraction. So personally, I would not go further for that reason in this context. But yes, you absolutely can. But I would choose this instead. Go. So if, if uh, it asks you to like, graph it, yeah, that's a great point. So as you and Gus just said, he's already, we're going to get to slope and y-intercept in the third lesson of this chapter. But yeah, here's your slope for those that are recognizing this. Negative 4 thirds is the slope, and 8 is the y-intercept. So for graphing, you should. So that's why I said in the context of this problem. Right? Oh, OK. But no, I want you to be clear with the way I'm speaking in that terms. In the context of a graphing problem, absolutely. But for a problem where I'm just finding the coordinates, and that's all I'm doing, five solutions, I would stay with one of them. Okay. So let's go ahead and pick numbers. It does not matter. You choose any numbers you want. I'm going to choose arbitrary values. Okay, you don't have to pick the same numbers as me. You really don't. I'm going to choose numbers and just plug them in and go through. You can if you want to to see that you get the same. Just to make caref be careful. So I take the 2 and plug it in over there. 16 minus 3. Or 16 over 3, rather.
Take a negative 4, it makes it a positive. It's 40 over 3. Take a 0, it becomes 8. Negative 7 is 28, 24. It's going to be 52 over 3. So whatever, whatever you've got in yours, right, might be different than mine, you need to do the same x. If you use the same x, just check your numbers. I want to point something out. This is just random math things, not, nothing to do with this class, but random math facts. How do I know if 52 is, is divisible by 3? What's the trick, Judy? Isn't it what? Or wait, no, I'm sorry. I know it, but I can't. Julian? If the, uh, if the uh, two digits add to multiple of 3. Exactly. What's 5 plus 2 here? So is 7 divisible by 3? Wow. So this is not. If you haven't known that, it's a good trick to know for big numbers. If you have like 132 over 3, 1 plus 3 plus 2 is 6, right? So 132 is divisible by 3. 44. Yeah, you can, it only works for 3 and 9. It works for 3 and 9. It's a good fun fact. You can do the same thing with 9. Think of all the multiples of 9. What do they add up to? 9. 81 is 9. 72 is 9. 63 is 9. Add the digits themselves. For 3 and 9, that's useful. There are other tricks as well. Seven has one, but it's a little funkier. Five ends in a zero or five, you know that one. There's a couple of those. Obviously, two is any even number. Anyhow, let's move on to the next one. I just thought, fun fact to see that. Any questions on this concept? Do we understand that there are infinitely many solutions here? Every time I pick another x, I get another y. And if I were to graph these five points, what shape would they make? A line, because it's a linear function. Okay? So let's go on. Solve the equation for this if the domain is given this time. So this is where we're going to really begin talking about the word domain. We have not used that phrase yet, and I want to start off in this chapter. So this is a very easy problem, but the word domain might not be, might not be familiar to everybody. Sean, tell us, what is domain? Domain refers to a list of all the possible x values. Correct. So if I said that a function is only existing for positive x values, maybe it's like the manufacturing of a product. You're not going to make negative products. So you would say x is greater than or equal to zero. You could have zero products made or positive amounts of products made. But you're not going to make a negative amount of iPods. So if you're doing the cost function as a function of iPods sold, iPods sell things now. iPhones. <laughs> totally kidding myself. I, iPods, iPads, whatever. iPhones. So if you're doing it as a function of things produced, it's got to be positive, right? So your domain can be restricted based on the context of the problem again. The context of the problem. So in this case, I'm given the domain. And what am I looking for? If I have the domain, I'm looking for the, what's the other word? The range, very good. And again, solve this equation for y. And we'll leave it like this again. I don't want to have to deal with x minus 4 or x plus 4 thirds. I know it reduces. And as, um, as Gus said a minute ago, if we're trying to graph this, then I will do that. The slope is 1, and the y-intercept is 4 thirds. But I don't care about graphing it right now, so I'm not going to go the extra step there. Plug a negative 2 in for x, I get negative 6 and 4. It's negative 2. Negative 2 thirds for the first one. Plug a 1 in for x, I get 3. 3 plus 4 is 7. That's going to be 7 thirds. And notice I'm leaving everything in fractions because when I have a third, it's going to be a repeating decimal. So I don't have to deal with that, right? I don't want to have to deal with that. Plug a 5 in for x, that's going to be a 15 plus 4, which is 19. And they're all thirds. And then finally, a 7 for x is 21 plus 4, which is 25 thirds. So take a look and make sure your numbers make sense. And again, yes, they do have decimal values, but I don't have to deal with writing the repeating bar line every time. And fractions are as good as decimals. And they, they don't have to be proper. Improper fractions are totally fine. That's like one of those stupid things in middle school, right? Remember when you were told, if you can't have an improper fraction, you always have to convert it to a mixed number? The reason teachers did that was to get you used to writing mixed numbers. That was it. But they were lying to you when they said you can't have an improper fraction. Improper fractions are used more often than decimals are, especially when it's like 25 sevenths. Well, that's a really messy decimal to have to write because it does have a repeated pattern, but it doesn't repeat for a while. Sure, thirds are easy because it's 0.33 or 0.66, 0 
but other fractions you want to keep as improper. Are we understood on this? Does it make sense? So here's my domain, and here's my resulting range. The range is in red for the given domain that's listed in black here. Soccer guys, do you have to leave this period or is it next period? It's after the period. After this period? Perfect. Okay. Ah, hold on. I'm sure if it's leave early. All right. Paul has $22 and he buys notebooks costing $2 each and binders costing $5 each. If he spends all $22, how many of each does he buy? So let's use let statements again. Let's use let statements. Give me, a, give me an idea. What do I want to start with, I'll tell you. Okay, and the other one then? No? Correct. Agree. Agree. And if you switch them with these other letters, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. This problem is not difficult, but there is a certain caveat. Or caveat? 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 caveat. Yeah, to it. There's something about it that's, that's odd, that's interesting to think about. Did you already see it already? There's something about the numbers as an answer. And I said a minute ago that we can get infinite solutions to a linear system, and this is going to be a linear system. It's not going to be infinite solutions this time. How come? What's the restriction, Olivia? Yeah. We can't buy negative notebooks or binders, so already we know that x and y have to be greater than zero. Agreed, everyone? Right? It has to be greater than zero. That's a domain restriction already. What's the second restriction? That's one restriction. What's the other? Hold on, make that up first. You got it? We can't be they can add up to more than 22. Okay. So there's only a limited amount of that Well, it says here that he spends all 22. Yeah. So that's even more specific, Nick. He can't be more than 22 or less than 22, right? But what about that makes the statement? I was just going to say that x and y have to be equal to the number. That's the statement right there. That's it. If he's buying exactly $22 worth of stuff, and suddenly you add up like five notebooks and six binders, it comes out to 28, it's not going to work, right? And you might say, oh, reduce the number of binders, and you end up with a fraction. Can't get a fraction of binders. So our domain and range restriction is that they have to be whole numbers and integers, both. Or just whole numbers, right? Because integers, the subset of integers is whole numbers. So our domain and range restriction in this case is the whole number system. Okay, the whole number system. We can't use integers always because they're negative, but we can't use fractions, so whole numbers work as our domain and range restriction. What's my equation for this? What's my equation for this, okay? So according to this, it means that it's $2 for a notebook. Yeah, that works. And $5 for a binder. That works too. Okay, $2 per notebook times the number of notebooks. This is really helpful for those that have been struggling maybe with the algebraic approach to the word problems, because I know some of you are still working on like tables and stuff. The algebra has to be there. $2 per notebook times the number of notebooks. $5 per binder times the number of binders. And then units are going to be dollars. Remember I did this with units one time? I'm going to show you that again. Okay, I'm going to emphasize this because I want you to see it. So watch what I'm going to do. And this is something you can write as like a side note. I'm not actually continuing the problem. I want to show you this. The units of 22 are dollars. The units of the number 2 are dollars per notebook. The units for X are number of notebooks. The units of 5 are dollars per binder. And the units for Y are binders. It's physically what I would say. Look at this. $22 equals $2 per notebook times X notebooks plus $5 per binder times Y binders. What happens to notebook and notebook? What happens to binder and binder? They cancel. They cancel. And what am I left with in units? I'm left with dollars plus dollars equals dollars, which is exactly what I need. Which is exactly what I need. You'll thank me when you get the physics. You're like, why does he care about units so much? Units matter so much, especially in physics when you get there. So try to get this around your head, try to wrap this around your head here so you're used to it so when you get to your physics course, you'll see that. Cancellation of units. It's called dimensional consistency. 
It means that the units or dimension are consistent throughout. You can't add, if I said to you, what's five centimeters plus two inches? What would you have to do before you get out? You convert one of them, right? You can't add five centimeters and two inches. You can't do it. You physically cannot do it. You can't say the answer is seven, because is it inches or is it centimeters? You're going to say inches, centimeters. So you have to convert one of them, and as a result, make the units consistent. Anyway, I diverge a lot there, sorry. X and Y can have certain values. We know already that they have to be whole numbers. So why don't we make whole numbers for one of them? So let's go ahead and make a little table on the left here for the possible values of X and Y. And let's use whole numbers for X to start. So X is the number of notebooks. You could have one notebook, two notebooks, three notebooks, four notebooks, up to how many? How many notebooks can you buy at most if you bought no binders at all, Sam? Four notebooks? Careful. Notebooks, not binders. You're doing binders. Notebooks. If I have all notebooks and I have 22 to spend, how many? 11. So I can go up to 11 only using whole numbers. Oops, I'm running out of room here. Now, we might pick up on a pattern in a minute and we'll see some of these that won't work, right? What would be very useful here again to do for my equation? Do I want to do this 11 times? No. So what should I do with the equation? What should I do with the equation? With the equation? Isolate the variable. Isolate the one you're solving, which is y in this case. We've defined x as these possible values. Let's go ahead and solve the equation for y so that it makes work a lot easier for us. Solving this for y, it's 22 minus 2x equals 5y. So therefore, y, y is going to equal to 22 minus 2x all over 5. That's what the equation for y is. Plug in a 1 for x. 22 minus 2 is 20. 20 over 5 is 4. So that works. So the first coordinate works. That's one of my solutions already. One notebook and four binders. And check it. Four times five is 20. One times two is two. 20 and two is 22. And you progress through the statements. Whenever you get a fractional answer for y, what do you do? Reject it. Cross it off. Say it doesn't work. Whatever it is you want to say. Plug in a two for x. A two for x makes it 22 minus four, which is 18. And this is 18 over five. Is that a whole number? It is not. So we reject this solution. It is not one of our answers and we progress through the entire table one after the other. The three next makes it 22 minus six is 16, right? Also not gonna work. The four next makes it 22 minus eight, which is 14. Have we picked up on the pattern by now? What's the pattern? And this is what Gus was kind of alluding to earlier. What's happening in shine? Uh, the y pieces, every time x goes up by one, the y pieces. Exactly. That's your slope, isn't it? Isn't that what slope is defined as? We'll get to slope again, we'll talk about it more, but that's what slope is. Every time x goes up by 1, y is going down by 2 fifths. So my slope would in this case be negative 2 fifths. That's what the slope is in later. But again, we'll get to that stuff. So the next one after 12, 14 fifths is? Does that work? No. So you have to do it. After that, 10 fifths. That works, right? So again, we can just write all of our answers out at this point. 12 fifths, 10 fifths. 8 fifths, 6 fifths, 4 fifths, 2 fifths, 0 fifths. So, I cross off 12 fifths, that's not a whole number. 8 fifths is not a whole number. 6 fifths is not a whole number. 4 fifths is not a whole number. 2 fifths is not a whole number, but 0 fifths is. And that was the one that Sam told us in the beginning, if you buy all 11 of them as notebooks. So let's, let's circle our three answers. Okay, so we have three solutions to this problem. Zero binders and 11 notebooks, two binders and six notebooks, or four binders and one notebook. Questions on this problem, John? Um, why does it have to be a whole number? Because couldn't you say that the decimals are equal to um, cents? No, these are numbers. Read the definition of x. What is the definition of x? Oh. Yeah, if it was dollars, it's different, John. Yeah, for sure. Does that make sense, what I'm saying, the answer? It's a really good question. Because if X and Y were representing dollars or numbers or like amounts physically of, of money, then you definitely can get a decimal. 
But since X and Y are the numbers of the notebooks, you can't have a half a notebook. I mean, you can, but you can't purchase a half a notebook. Okay. We have one more. We have one more for today. Now, this last one is a little bit tough. And it's the challenge problem that I think your book throws in there to make you think outside the box. I want to, if possible, do we have time? I want to show you what does the bell say? 2.20. All right. So we have 15 minutes. I want to give you five minutes on your own to really try to figure this out. Let's see if we can do it. It's not an easy problem. It might look easy at first, but it's not. And if you want to, pair up with the person next to you, or a trio up, if there's three of you guys there together. The three of you guys can work together, the two of you, the three guys there. Maybe you guys can do two, and then three, or three, and then two, whatever. Feel free to work with someone, but I want you to maybe work with someone else that's around your area to try to figure this out. I'll try this Take the number 53. 53 is really 5 times 10 plus 3 times 1. Does everybody agree with that? 5 times 10 plus 3 times 1. The tens place and the units place. Remember that from like second grade, right? The units place, the tens place. So this number is really 10x plus y. Again, if this were a 5, it would be 10 times 5 to give you 50. If this were a 3, it would be plus the 3 at the end. Yes? The other number, the other number is 10y plus x. And the first number that we started with was this guy up here. This was the original number, and this is the new number right here. And it says when the digits are interchanged, the result, this is the result right here, exceeds the original by more than, keywords, more than 36. So it's an inequality. It's not an equation in this. Uh, you could say by exactly 36 and then it's an equation okay. because it says more than it's an equality. So we do the following. We say again that the result, which is this, is exceeding the original statement by, 30, by more than 36. So the result exceeds the original. Let me think if I'm doing this right is greater than the original plus 36. Now, this is not the answer, obviously, because it says find all positive two-digit odd numbers. So what else do we have to then do? Make a number for x, put a number for y. Make a number for x, put a number for y. And we can simplify this, right? Can we come up, combine like terms? Let's go ahead and simplify. So if I subtract y from both sides, subtract y, this becomes 9y plus x greater than 10x plus 36. Subtract 10x from both sides, this will become 9y minus 9x greater than 36. And then at this point, we can try values for x and y. What's the condition though? It says that the original number was an odd number. Right? Find all positive two-digit odd numbers. And the original number had y in the units place. So y must be an odd number. So when you go to make your table now for x and y to see which of these statements is true, y can only be 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. See what you get for the x values. x has to be positive. Make sure that it's greater than 36. Homework tonight is doing homework on the next slide. Let's see you go. Thanks for visiting.